So it seems like I'm going to have to learn Hindi. <laughs> mm. Good, good, okay. So, what are we talking tonight? <laughs> mm. I guess there's so many things to say. Okay, so uh, this is it. The last talk, last time we were together in this hall. Um, it's been quite a pleasure and an honor to uh, see everybody uh, get bright and light and smiley and uh, make such wonderful progress. I think everybody here, really, without exception. <laughs> and um, yeah, what a wonderful opportunity to, uh, to be here and to witness uh, this amazing Sangha that is flourishing. Um, wonderful, wonderful. So much merit, lots of punya in 10 days. So, so one of the topics I like to end retreat with is... Uh, why is friendship? And basically there is this, um, I, I found this uh, beautiful little gem when I was in Bodh Gaya. I was looking through my things and um, I forgot about this, this one uh, sutta which says, uh, this is the herald. This is the very first sign of the sun rising, that is the dawn. And he says, and this is the herald the very first sign of the path of the awakened ones arising, that is wise friendship. And then I see this, <laughs> and I see uh, so many uh, wise friends. It's wonderful to, uh, to see uh, within this, here in this Sangha, in this community. So what we've been doing here is uh, is all about, uh, it all rests into wise friendship. And this is one of the really important aspects of the path, where Ananda came to the Buddha once and said, uh, Bhante, this, this surely must be at least half of the holy life. 
wise friendship, good, co good companions, good friends, wise friends. And the Buddha <laughs> replied, don't say that, Ananda, don't say that. It is the whole of the path. <laughs> because it's because of wise friends that we get to encounter the Dhamma, to hear the Dhamma, and to practice it and slowly get closer and closer to this wonderful liberation. And the Buddha being our first Kalyanamitta, basically. So that, and he said that. <laughs> so um, he said, well, if, if it wasn't because of me, then there wouldn't be uh, this Dhamma practice. And then, so, and then from there, it trickles down through, through the Sangha, through the ages, 2,000, almost 600 years now. And that's quite, quite amazing. Um, and these, uh, this wise friendship is also found in the four pillars of the sasana, basically the, the monks, the nuns, the lay practitioners, and then the female lay practitioners. So these four pillars of the sasana are completely essential for the good turning of the wheel, basically. So, um, as you know, monks cannot do much without <laughs> being supported. So, and, and lay practice is absolutely essential uh, for this sasana to run. And it's really beautiful to see so many people dedicating at least 10 days in, in their lives and then hopefully some, a few hours every day. <laughs> so. And a topic that is very close to wise friendship is also something that is called the stream of the Dhamma. And uh, this is a, a topic that is uh, quite interesting also. Uh, we're at the, the end of the retreat and um, there's all kinds of talking about entering the stream and all these things nowadays, like sotapatti, basically, sotapanna. And uh, I think they just go really well and hand in hand together, the wise friendship and entering the stream, basically, because they that's basically what it means also uh, if, if you look at how the Buddha described how the path arises basically and and actually the Buddha also said uh, no not the Buddha but it was a question um, somebody asked uh, the stream of the Dhamma the stream of the Dhamma but what is the stream of the Dhamma it is just this eightfold noble path and so um, there are a lot of theories about what that means, uh, entering the stream. <laughs> and uh, when we look at the suttas, we find that there are a few ways that we can tell, uh, like the Buddha at one point, um, so many people came to him to ask, so is this person a stream enterer or this or is this person a stream enterer? And then that person would pass away and then it was like, that person's passed away. What is this future born? And where, where did he go? Is he a stream enterer? And, you know, like thousands of people were coming to him. <laughs> and then at some point he told An Ananda, like, you know, Ananda, like, this is kind of tiring me <laughs> when everybody comes to me and asks if they're stream enterers. So I will tell you a way that you can tell for yourself if somebody you know or if you think you you can tell for yourself what if you're attained stream entry and he said uh, four things that are now known as the four factors of stream entry he said one and it's called the mirror of the dhamma basically so one has unwavering confidence in the buddha one has unwavering confidence in the Dhamma. Usually when one has unwavering confidence in the Dhamma, they will have unwavering confidence in the, in the Buddha because he's just naturally the one who taught it. And then one has unwavering confidence in the Sangha. And that means Sangha here is not necessarily 
robed Sangha. Sangha is the Arya Puggala. So anyone that has entered the stream or beyond that. And that means simply those who are understanding and practicing the Dhamma to a certain extent. And so, uh, and then unwavering confidence in the virtues are uh, the virtues of the awakened ones, basically. That is the five precepts, basically, to, to make it short. Um, so this is not uh, poured in concrete, like there's not a stage that you get to which like, boom, you're a stream enterer and we give you a certificate and you say, hey, congratulations, you became a stream enterer. That's not the way it works. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but rather it is a slow dip. <laughs> we kind of put our feet in and then check it out and it's like oh it feels nice and then we learn more and we go deeper and um, a little bit more we have uh, some friends around us to teach us how to swim <laughs> and uh, slowly we get there and in fact there's a few levels before that to be honest there is a faith follower someone who just hears the Dhamma and gains faith and really feels uplifted that can go away, but at least they're, uh, they're uplifted by the Dhamma and they are starting to have interest. Then there's a Dhamma follower who will take that interest and go beyond a little bit and start studying. And then there's really what we call stream entry, where somebody would pretty much dedicate more of their time and more of their understanding towards goodness, the Dhamma. And I'll take a break here. <laughs> so that is the trick that the Buddha gave us. Like that is directly from the Buddha. And it's found in more than one place, maybe in like three or four places. So that's pretty safe. <laughs> Usually that's what it means. If you can find the same sutta or same structure in one Nikaya and another and another then you're starting to, you can have a lot more confidence in, in that kind of stuff. And that's one, uh, one of the things that, that happens. Uh, it's found throughout the, the suttas. And uh, using the mirror of Dhamma is not, of course, it's not flawless, it's not perfect. And so that's why I would um, also add this uh, recommendation uh, because I talked about it on the retreat, um, just just to like a like an insurance on the the Buddha's mirror. <laughs> uh, maybe allow yourself like ten years, <laughs> and look in the mirror for ten years, <laughs> maybe twenty. <laughs> and because maybe now faith is feeling like pretty strong, because we've just finished a ten day retreat, uh, but like all causes and conditions are perfect right now. <laughs> but that's not when you look for wavering in your confidence. You look for wavering in your confidence when things go bad. <laughs> if you think, for example, just like this, uh, somebody, a, a nanagami, who thinks that they don't have any more anger. Well, when everything is fine, anger is not going to arise. And that's why it gets tricky. Because when we think that we're anagamis, for example, and then, you know, maybe the situation that's going to trigger your anger will not happen if for the next three years. But maybe in three years, something's going to happen and you'll be like, oh, <laughs> yeah, that's still there. <laughs> so, and it's the same thing for any of those levels of attainment. So it's to be taken with wisdom and discernment, applying your mind to not just gobble up uh, if somebody tells you like, oh, you're this or that, or because I know that, you know, in Burma, they hand out certificates. I hear it's happening in Sri Lanka too. Like, hey, you've become a stream enterer and you've become this, or there was this uh, story where uh, this lady who um, 
uh, her family wanted her to like take a retreat and then she was like yeah I should go back again and then that monastery was handing out certificates and uh, she was good she went and she did the retreat and at the end of the retreat uh, they like give her a certificate that hey, congratulations you're a stream enter and she gets really mad and then she says what like I don't understand like Last time you gave me anagami. <laughs> so so <laughs> things like that, you know, that's pretty much what it's worth. <laughs> so, you know, the in instances in the suttas where that comes up, actually it's only the Buddha that said, uh, confirmed these states with people because he was pretty much the only one who could do that. Then the only other references we have is like people dying on their deathbed and uh, saying to a monk, uh, like a famous monk or something, and then they would go like, uh, Bhante, I do not see any of the five lower fetters in my mind anymore. And then the monks would say, good, very good. It's, it's a good gift for you that you see that within you, but they would never, never tell someone. So these things, you know, we, uh, we, it's part of our practice. It's part of the landmarks that we use to see, okay, where am I? You know, how's the anger arising? How's the desire for things arising? Is it really like bursting through the ceiling? Or is it, you know, okay, that's pretty moderate. And, uh, oh yeah, that situation really used to trigger me big time. And now it's kind of, it's mild. It's still there. And it's going to change, like some situations will trigger you a lot more than others. So, um, these things are really to be approached with your own wisdom. And uh, it's like the rest of the path, you know, when you start with the metta and then you let it go through naturally through the, each of the Brahma Viharas and then it goes to still mind. You know you're not forcing that. Well, it's the same thing with so-called attainments. You just let it go. You just see and then it, it will move to there. Like you don't have to do anything about it. So at some point the mind will be purified from these things and then you'll be able to see, yeah, I haven't seen anger in, in a long time actually or impatience. Uh, and you know, at that point, for example, it's not going to be full-fledged anger. So don't, don't look for anger. Look for impatience. <laughs> See, that's, that's also another point where people miss it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm just going to let you... <laughs> so two years ago, I, I was talking to a very good friend of mine. And um, I said to him, you know, like... If someone were to believe they're an arahant, that would probably be the biggest hindrance you could ever have. <laughs> and we both start laughing. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's the same thing when we believe we're something that we're not. That's a really huge hindrance. Like believing, one believing they're an anagami, for example. And then there's anger arising, but then they wouldn't see that as anger because they think they're an anagami. So that's, that's problematic. <laughs> because then, then it, yeah. And then like desire arising for the senses and then not seeing that as an actual thing that says like, hey, you're, you're not that. <laughs> but believing is just like, well, no, it's, it's, it's not that actually. It's not a hindrance. So, see, it gets really problematic when, when that starts to happen. So, um, although these things still are possible, and even in this day and age, um, it's still very possible. But, um, yeah, I, I just like to um, also bring more awareness around that topic. There's, of course, a lot more to say about that. but. I just want to, because I'll be speaking a little bit about, it's a really nice sutta to end with, and it talks a little bit about, uh, you know, daily practice, how to be mindful in daily life, and it's just perfect. Um, 
and it talks about the four factors of stream entry, which is something that the Buddha talked a lot about. Uh, when he talks about recollecting the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, and the virtue, and the generosity as uplifting recollections which bring up gladness, bring up joy, bring up tranquility, bring up happiness, and collectedness. And this is found throughout the suttas in a lot of places. So, to fill you in for the rest of what stream and tree might mean, basically, is that there's also three things that are said to be given up, basically. Sakkaya ditti, which is the um, false belief in self, in a personal me, ego kind of thing. But there's a difference here between mana and sakkaya ditti, which is um, the theoretical understanding of it, of like you know enough of Dhamma that you know that, yeah, it doesn't really make sense that I am like, I am. <laughs> or just that there is a me, there is a self, there is a uh, uh, doing all these things that is permanent, everlasting, eternal, and all that. And you start to understand a little bit more dependent origination, the six sense bases, and all of that. But mana is really like the complete eradication of like ego or conceit. So there, these are two very different, you know, levels. It's not that, and this is get getting confused nowadays because some people like make a really big deal of stream entry like saying like you basically shouldn't have like any kind of personality view where well the rest of the fetters seem to contradict that because you still have anger and you still have desire for sensual desires I mean I mean you still get caught up so obviously it's still there <laughs> And actually, the Saka, uh, Sakadagami will basically uh, calm down these fetters and they won't be eradicated, they'll still be there. And it's only in Anagami that they completely are gone sensory desires and uh, ill will or anger. So, obviously, there's still a kind of a tendency to believe in one's kind of. Uh, storylines and all these ideas that we have about ourselves but theoretically we understand yeah it doesn't really make sense that you know anymore so you can't really believe in that anymore so that's what Sakai Diti means uh, and that happens so basically when when one understands the Dhamma one understands uh, a little bit of more about Paticca Samuppada the dependent origination uh, one starts to understand that yeah like this I am, this me, this ego thing is kind of like, it's kind of overrated and it doesn't really work when you see it properly. <laughs> so, and that's actually a real relief, like very big relief, uh, just to start to see things in that way because we start seeing things so personally all the time. And that really helps, even though it's still there, it really helps to see in that way. So next would be sila bata paramasa, uh, clinging to r blind rites and rituals. And uh, now this means basically um, like ritual bathing will wash away your sins. Uh, this is exactly what that means. Uh, like um, nowadays it's being kind of misunderstood a little bit. Some people say like uh, taking the refuges and the precepts is like sila bata paramasa, basically. But that's not really accurate. If we do it properly, it's, it's got nothing to do with clinging to rites and rituals. We just train to remember these virtues and to basically make sure that we know what they are and to practice them, basically. And taking refuge in the Buddha Dhamma Sangha, well, I mean, it's pretty wholesome. <laughs> so. Um, but I think that the Buddha, when he said that, from my own limited understanding of all this, is that um, maybe you've read the Vedas, <laughs> and maybe you've read the hymns, and um, maybe you've, uh, you know, maybe what I'm talking about, the rites and rituals, the Agni Puja, the fire worship, 
all of that. Um, and I think personally also this is where the Buddha took, took his analogy of Nibbana, the putting out of the fire, basically was part of the, you know, the huge emphasis on uh, fire worship, basically. And the Buddha was like, no, like put out the fire. <laughs> so it was uh, in so many ways, that, and of course he's thinking about a lot of things there, but um, really um, some, at the, at the time of the Buddha, it was prevalent, it was rampant with a lot of uh, basically rituals, lots of rituals, uh, even sacrifice and things like that, believing that this will be beneficial for the gods and then beneficial for us. And then so, so but the Buddha said like, no, this, when you see the Dhamma, when you see really uh, what the reality is, then all of this, it just falls off because it's, it's seen as pointless. It's like, why would I do these things when I know uh, right effort, the right course of action, holding the virtues, the law of karma, dependent origination, then none of this is like relevant, really. So this falls away. That's another thing that falls away. And this seems uh, kind of interesting because it's not just uh, in, in India's history. I was in uh, Teotihuacan in Mexico on the top of the pyramid there. And um, actually, <laughs> don't ask me the story. <laughs> We're going to be here for a long time. Um, and then I learned that actually it's, it was also uh, traditions there too. They were like uh, sacrificing like young virgin. It's kind of disgusting actually, but um, it's really like it seems to be some kind of undercurrent that happens in a lot of spiritual kind of worships. And to me, like that the Buddha just like puts an end to all of that is pretty pretty great, really, to be honest. <laughs> and then there is, uh, there is doubt. And this is where uh, the four factors of stream entry come into play. Because wichikicha, doubt, is not doubt like uh, you wake up in the morning and you think like, mm, should I have tea or coffee or, <laughs> or maybe sugar or jaggery or I don't know. That's got nothing to do with what we're talking about here. It's doubt in the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, and the virtue. And that's it. So that doubt, this is where we also find the four factors of stream entry. And the doubt is gone. You can have whoever, a Mahatera, has been like a hundred years in the robes, it comes to you and tells you you don't understand anything about Dhamma. What you know is wrong. It's not going to change anything for you because you know Dhamma. So was it going to change? You're still going to go into your meditation. You're still going to experience the same thing. And there is a way that it, it happens like that. And so, so when does it really become something that you like really completely see that theoretically there's no self and then that you're not clinging to any rites and rituals and then that you have unwavering confidence in the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha and the virtues? Hard to tell. <laughs> but there is also, for every of the Arya Pugalas, the awakened people, there is the path and there is the fruition, the Magga and the Pala. And so this is also a very important difference. And so a lot of people can be on the path and be cultivating the path. And in fact, the Buddha says anybody who's on the path now when they die or uh, before they, they die, they will realize the fruit. So if you're able to maintain just the path throughout your life, you will get the fruit at the end of your life. Um, this was said by the Buddha. How does that work? I don't have the algorithm for it. Uh, I don't know. You know ask Google. They were talking if you strongly believe in all four qualities. Yes. In the end, yes. you will see Yes, yes. Or we, if you see Vipana first time, then mm -hmm. second time you definitely will see. Or like, mm -hmm. I mean. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, in nowhere in this is the Buddha talking about experiencing Nibbana, for just to be clear. Uh, there is no clear uh, scheme in the suttas or the Buddha that was elaborating any kind of progressive, uh, exact experience of that was related to an experience of Niroda Samapati and an experience of Magga and Pala and a clear sequence. Although I can say that in my researches, I can definitely say that Mahasi Sayadaw in his book, uh, what's it called even, I don't, Inside the Manual of Insight, that is one place you can see such a scheme. And it would make sense that um, a person would like to copy-paste that scheme, basically. Uh, Mahasi Sayadaw spoke of uh, his whole path of experiencing all of the insight knowledges, the jnanas, basically, which, by the way, are not found in the suttas. Um, and then one would enter this sankarupeka jnana, basically. For those of you who've practiced any kind of vipassana, this is when you get so disgusted with the pain in your body that you just shut it off. <laughs> and you can stay in there for a very long time because you don't feel anything. <laughs> That's called sankarupeka jnana, the, the equanimity with all formations. And then when you're steady in that state, uh, you get so disgusted that you completely uh, remove yourself from all of that and there's a kind of a cessation that happens. Although this is not the same cessation that we talk in, so this is a very different experience. Um, it doesn't lead to the same thing and uh, because, I mean, the whole path to get there is different also. And I'm not gonna, you know, go into great details about this, but just to make, like, draw a line where, you know, this is one thing and what we're practicing here is another. And where this uh, venerable uh, Mahasi Sayadaw is taking that from is from a book called the Visuddhi Magga. And this is another place where you can see where that scheme happens, where one would enter Niroda and then experience a magga, and then another time pala, and then another time sakadagami, some kind of elaborate scheme like that. But in reality, when you really know the suttas very well, when you know the actual Buddha vachana, what the Buddha said, this is nowhere to be found. And we find a really different approach, which is much more, much less, uh, much less clearly defined and much more open for some kinds of interpretations. Uh, to a certain level. Of course, there's some factors that need to be fulfilled, but there is some room around that. I just want to say, though, now having kind of brought down the whole curtain, <laughs> sorry, but this I want to tie back into our practice. And somebody who experiences Niroda Samapati in this particular practice and Nibbana even if it's like just the kiss and then I'm talking about the Nibbana kiss which happens like like this because at the beginning the mind will only experience it for a very short time and one has seen all the jhanas with very good sharp clarity of wisdom and discernment and the Brahma Viharas the whole sequence and is really settled into this and then experience uh, Niroda or Nibbana now, even though the Buddha doesn't link it to any of the fruits or the paths, I mean, at that point, you have a pretty solid understanding of this whole path. Because now you're not just... And that's, see, that's the problem nowadays, is that because of uh, certain practices that have arisen over the millennia, like absorption concentration, which have basically made jhana alien to the population basically you're gonna to have to be a monk for 10 15 years to like practice seven hours a day meditation to actually experience all these jhanas then it it just rips away one of the most important part of the path basically and then one cannot see the whole path and it becomes inaccessible 
<laughs> I never know. Uh, yeah, you just go. Um, yes. And so with the open, aware jhanas that you've been practicing here, uh, it's, that's just to give it a name because when you say jhana nowadays, it just is interpreted right away as absorption concentration, which is just, yeah, it's just unfortunate, but that's just what happens. So we kind of have to give it a name, even though it doesn't need a name. It's just also, we, I call them the sutta jhanas or the buddha's jhanas, like compared to, anyways, the visuddhimagga jhanas, basically. Um, then it's so special, this teaching here, because the wheel is turning again the path is whole again and you can actually see it for yourself and practice it for yourself you don't have to be a monk of course of course you can still be a monk you know but you don't have to <laughs> and anyone can experience that for themselves and this path is to be experienced for by the wise for themselves and it's immediately effective i mean you don't have to practice 15 years as a monk it's immediate, like it's not delayed in time, it's not, and it's not affected by time, it doesn't change. That teaching, of course, if we interpret it in a wrong way, then, then of course that can be problematic, but when we understand it in the right way, it's, it's applicable here and now, by the wise, you can see it. And so, when one understands and practices all the way through all of these open aware jhanas, the sutta jhanas, then one can experience, I call it samma niroda, <laughs> samma nibbana, <laughs> basically, because there's been so many things said about these things now, so we have to come up with these words, unfortunately. <laughs> And, and actually, you know, you can tell for yourself. And once you experience that, and in fact, one can experience that and fall off, unfortunately. And so be careful about that. Even if you experience it, it doesn't mean that it's unshakable. Continue, continue practicing it, continue consolidating it. And then at one point, you'll get a good sense. You'll be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, this is not going. <laughs> this is not going anywhere. <laughs> like whatever happens is, is not going to go. And then you, you can tell, okay, now I'm pretty confident about it. Like really pretty confident. And things will happen and you'll get even more confirmation and more confirmation. And the more you go there, the more you go get it, the more you... So basically I say it's, it's another kind of mental impression basically. When people enter Nibbana, Niroda, more and more, or the longer you stay with the still mind in neither perception and non-perception or bare awareness, this will leave an impression in your mind. And it's basically voidness, the impression of voidness, basically. That's more and more what the mind is going to look like from the inside out. <laughs> So there will be things happening, but there will be a very calm, unwavering kind of voidness at the back, which supports whatever is happening. And more and more, this will just kind of help you remove anything that's happening, which, you, which is hard or kind of uh, causing friction or whatever. It's, it's actually easy to dissolve in there. <laughs> hard to explain, but it does leave an impression on the mind and that impression grows over time. And this is what you want to look for. This is what you want to uh, look for as like a marker of your own progress, basically. Your mind will be more and more free, more and more liberated. So that was a massive introduction. <laughs> so, 
Um, so I just want to summarize this. Uh, I kind of rip off the curtain here of the kind of really clear-cut progress through like uh, the Arya Pugalas in some kind of Niroda Samapati attainment kind of scheme. But I also wanted to feed in that someone who experiences this teaching all the way to the end is pretty much locked in anyways. So uh, that's for sure. <laughs> I mean, there, there, it will be quite easy to see uh, when, when one experiences more and more the end of that path. I mean, it's just going to become natural. So I don't really, I don't think we need a scheme that is really elaborate to know this, but you can definitely know this for yourself. And I don't even have to tell you, you will know. So that's the best about it too. Um, and I'm not even going to ever tell you or anybody. So <laughs> I'm just going to tell you to keep practicing. So <laughs> that's it. So here, um, Nandiya, the Buddha's cousin, is uh, asking uh, the Buddha about uh, people who... Basically, if people who do not have any of the four factors of stream entry, if they live their, mi their lives uh, mindlessly or without being uh, aware. And so he says, Bhante, those wise practitioners who are thoroughly and completely devoid of all four, all four qualities of stream entry, are they not living in negligence? And so, huh? Completely, utterly devoid of any of those. So that kind of gives us a little bit of like a, of an insight on like actually, there's quite a bit of room here, you know. <laughs> so, mm. Nandiya, those who are thoroughly and completely devoid of all four factors of stream entry, these I call people who stand outside this teaching in the midst of those who do not even practice. Interesting. Huh. So, I guess we have some people here with qualities of stream entry, so it seems, just that you're standing here in the midst of this assembly, listening to the Dhamma with a faithful heart that's been practicing for 10 days. It, it would seem logical to think that uh, um, you are um, standing somewhat within this teaching, at least for 10 days, <laughs> and that uh, you are practicing. <laughs> so it seems quite logical to think that you're doing pretty good. But as to how a wise practitioner might live mindlessly or mindfully, listen and apply your mind carefully, I will explain it to you. Yes, Bhante. Here, a wise practitioner is filled with confident understanding about the Buddha. Now, I, I'm not going to go into details because, you know, it's, it's already kind of been long and I'll, I'll go through it quite. Uh, so, he's recollecting either like the Buddha's qualities, the Dhamma's qualities, the Sangha's qualities, or the four, uh, the virtues. Uh, and this is like a ETP, so Bhagava, Araham, Samma, Sambuddha. Uh, like the, the Blessed One is an Arahant, fully awakened, all of these things. And then the Dhamma is well explained, uh, all of it. Or else a wise practitioner is filled with confident understanding about the virtue of the realized ones, which is unbroken, unflawed, spotless, unsullied, liberating and taught by the wise, appeasing and which turns into mental collectedness. So again, I'm not even making that up. The virtue is leading to mental collectedness. That practitioner rests content. Oh, this sounds like problems. <laughs> with this unflagging understanding and does not make any further effort to meditate by day nor for mental solitude at night. Meditation and viveka were basically the same thing in the Buddha's words. Living mindlessly in that way, that means not even 
even though you've attained something great on a particular retreat or a discourse, let's say you hear the Buddha talk at some point and you just like realize something deep and you have this unwavering confidence in the Buddha, yet you don't practice after. So that is called living mindlessly <laughs> it's for the Buddha. Living mindlessly in this way, there is no gladness. When there is no gladness, there is no joy. When there is no joy, there is no tranquility. When there is no tranquility, one lives in displeasure. For one who lives in displeasure, the mind does not become collected and harmonious. With such a scattered mind, the nature of mental states does not grow clear. When the nature of mental states does not grow clear, one can be regarded as dwelling mindlessly. So, here's the definition of mindfulness for you. <laughs> <clears throat> now, living mindfully. How does a practitioner live mindfully? Nandiya, a wise practitioner, is filled with confident understanding about the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, and the virtues of the awakened ones, which are unbroken. This is what he called, like he describes the virtues of the Aryas, and this is how we see. They are unbroken, unflawed, spotless, unsullied, liberating, taught by the wise, appeasing, and which turn into mental collectedness. That practitioner does not become complacent with this unflagging understanding and, diligent, and diligently meditates by day and is devoted to mental seclusion, viveka, at night. See, one a little bit in the morning, a little bit in the evening. Living mindfully in this way, there is gladness. When there is gladness, there is joy. When there is joy, there is tranquility. When there is tranquility, one lives in happiness. When one lives in happiness, the mind becomes collected and harmonious. With such a collected and composed mind, the nature of mental states grows clear. And when the nature of mental states grow clear, one can be regarded as dwelling mindfully. So again, this is, um, seems to be a really good definition of mindfulness, uh, sati, or uh, and also a really um, tangible way, tangible advice to uh, how to approach the daily life that is just coming tomorrow uh, out the doors uh, into the wilderness of the world. So um, I just thought I would offer this tonight because uh, it seemed uh, quite uh, on point, uh, this beautiful advice from the Buddha to how to, you know, you, we've all been practicing here on retreat and we've been, everybody here has been doing really good, uh, really amazing progress and lots of smiles and lots of really light spirits around. So it's really good to see and it's actually genuine. <laughs> now it's gotten to that point. <laughs> Well, it, it, everybody's got has made it to the make it point, not not just the fake it until <laughs> everybody's made it, and so that's quite um, it's quite amazing to see. <laughs> so don't sit on your laurels and keep practicing, <laughs> and invest in your own happiness. Really, that's what it is. And uh, I, I can only recommend that, you know, whatever happens for you in your life, uh, just remember, remember to keep banking uh, a few hours for your own happiness every day. Uh, and then whatever you're going to do is going to be fine. 
So that's the general advice. <laughs> really, like, it's not about, oh yeah, like do this career or do that career or like you should do this or not do that. Just meditate and then it'll be fine. <laughs> You're likely to take good decisions, smart decisions, and you'll be happy because you'll have gladness, you'll have joy, you'll have tranquility, you'll have happiness, and you'll have collectedness of mind. And that is just a blissful way to live your life. And so in this particular tradition, we usually recommend, uh, because this is pretty much the day that we, we talk about these things. I think I said it on interview to pretty much everybody, but I'll just repeat it because just to make sure. Usually we recommend uh, going back home and doing a two hour sit. Uh, yeah, two hour sit for one sit basically. Um, because if we try to uh, do a, one hour in the morning, one hour in the evening, which is also really good. It's not that it's bad, don't get me wrong. But there's a slight tweak here, is that the two hour sit will allow your mind to taste again the really deeper bliss of either the still mind or the advanced uh, Brahma Viharas. And you will not get that taste if you try one hour, one hour. So it's in fact better we recommend uh, two hours sit, one sit every day. We know that people usually won't have more time than this in the day to if you're working. Of course if you can, I mean by all means please indulge and uh, bank more hours but usually that's not the case, it's not possible. But these longer sits are very important. They will remind you how good this is. And if you only take an hour, then actually usually it will take a mind, the mind one full hour to untangle itself. And then the second hour is actually when it gets good. And you, it's like you would be like basically keeping yourself away from that. The best part, basically. So this is one of the advice we give. And so what you've experienced on retreat uh, in the past 10 days, well, nine or eight, I'm, anyways, um, you will be able to maintain with a two hour sit every day. Now, of course, if you can't do that, don't worry, that's fine. Just do what you can. If, if for you, you've been doing an hour and a half or an hour and 15 minutes, try to go, try to go the full length. I mean, if you want to try two hours, that's great. But, you know, sometimes it's just too much for, for some people. So don't worry about that. If you're not at the stage of, you know, doing a full two hours, you can do one hour and one hour. That's fine. But again, that's, we, that's the recommendation. And so far, we notice that meditators are able to maintain what they've gained on retreat with a two-hour sit in one sit every day. So... Uh, this seems to be pretty general across the board. Yes. The other thing that is to consider is, um, so what's the meditation now? <laughs> uh, so what am I supposed to do? Now coming out, things will be different, obviously. Um, mind will be agitated, it will be thinking, it will be restless, there will be hindrances. Every time you begin your meditation, you can, I mean, if you're able to maintain the still mind and equanimity, for example, great. But chances are that uh, mind's gonna be a little agitated. If you can start with the still mind right away and equanimity, great, do it. Um, but if you start experiencing uh, problems, uh, and it's like it's not as clear as it used to be, then go back to the beginning. And this will make sure that the, the, the whole meditation progress will happen properly. You start back with the metta. Either it's radiating in the directions, if that's uh, what you feel like. If, if that's still too much, then go back with the spiritual friend. Go back to nurturing the metta for a while. It will go up into the head as it gets lighter and then you know what to do. Open it up to the directions and then it will take the time that it needs to go to the place that it needs. And then it will get purified at these stations. Who knows how long it's going to be. 
but then after that it's just going to flow right back into the place where it's most comfortable and if you experience the still mind then it will just go right back in this can be one minute this can be five minutes this can be 10 minutes this can be 20 minutes it can be half an hour it can be an hour it can take the whole sit but no matter how long it takes you know the process now so and if you apply that then everything will be fine so don't don't think the metta is like going back down into your practice it's actually it's just part of the practice it's part of your wisdom when mind is agitated it's, it's gotten coarse like you've been active you've been doing things it's, it's normal so go back to the metta clear the slate and then Good. So I, uh, there was a special request tonight for the Dhamma Chakka Pavatana Sutta. Um, I usually don't end the retreat with that particular sutta, but uh, I think uh, the request probably should be heard and uh, uh, respected. Uh, and I mean, it's not like it's a bad sutta. <laughs> and also, um, really. Um, because I was thinking about like, how do I approach this <laughs> I was really wondering and then I thought well you know like right now this is quite amazing like this center is being used for the first time and I'm seeing the Sangha which is really growing here in India and uh, it really does feel like the wheel is starting to turn so why not <laughs> um, so I'll try to be somewhat diligent. It's not like an extremely long sutta anyways. And so, uh, just so you know, this is the first discourse of the Buddha to the five ascetics that he had been practicing. They were Jain ascetics basically, uh, doing all these tapas, uh, harsh austerities. And they left him because he started eating a little bit of food. They said like, well, we're done with this one. He's just reverted to a life of luxury. So that's the, what they said about him. <laughs> Good friends. <laughs> but uh, he saw in his mind that they still, they were probably the people that had the clearest faculties to understand what he discovered, even though he knew that it would take some convincing probably. So this is what he said to them, and it actually touches to the core of uh, the Buddha's teaching and the six R's, the right effort, really. And not only in this, like uh, you'll see, this is not only just an exposition of the Four Noble Truths, which is usually how it's understood, it's how you don't stop at the Four Noble Truths, you have to practice the Four Right Efforts with it. And so I'll, I'll just uh, give you a little uh, reminder when that sequence happens, uh, so you know. So without uh, waiting any longer. Once the awakened one was living in Varanasi, in the dear sanctuary. There the awakened one told the group of five monks, monks, these two dead ends should not be practiced by one gone forth. What two? Immoderate indulgence in sensory gratification, which is base, vulgar, materialistic, and not honorable, and not conducive to happiness. And indulging into self-inflicted penances, which are painful, not honorable, and not conducive to happiness. Monks, by avoiding these, both these extremes, the truth finder has fully awakened to the middle path, which imparts vision and understanding, which leads to calm and goes beyond knowledge, the complete awakening and Nibbana. And what is this middle path? It is this eight-spoke path of the awakened, namely wise understanding, wise intention, wise speech, wise behavior, wise living, wise practice, wise awareness, and wise meditation. This is the middle path that the truth finder has fully awakened to, which imparts vision and understanding, which leads to calm and goes beyond knowledge, 
the complete awakening and Nibbana. Now monks, understanding what is troublesome is conducive to awakening. That is, taking birth is troublesome, aging is troublesome, diseases are troublesome, death is troublesome, coming upon undesired things is troublesome, being separated from desired things is troublesome, not getting what one wants is troublesome, in brief, the five fabrics of the ego are indeed troublesome. Then monks understanding the cause of trouble is conducive to awakening, that is, this discon discontent, thirst, which are the very fuel for taking action propelled by seeking happiness in wanting constantly. Seeking happiness and attachment in trifling material things, that is, wishing for sensory stimulation, which, wishing for things to happen, and wishing for things not to happen. Then monks, understanding the release from trouble is conducive to awakening, that is, the complete appeasement and release from that very discontent, giving it up, letting it go, releasing it and unlatching from it. This is what that means. I just want to read the Pali because it's, I like it more. Tanhaya, tanhaya asesa viraga nirodo, chago patinisago mutti analayo. Then monks, understanding the practice which leads to the release from trouble is conducive to awakening. This eight-spoke path of the awakened, which is wise understanding, wise intention, wise speech, wise behavior, wise living, wise practice, wise awareness, and wise meditation. When I realized this is troublesome, I began to understand a dhamma unheard before. Vision arose, understanding arose, discernment arose, awareness arose, and clarity arose. When I realized this truth is to be continually recognized. Sounds familiar? <laughs> Good. That's just a tweak in my translation here. <laughs> I began to understand a Dhamma unheard before. Vision arose, understanding arose, discernment arose, awareness arose, and clarity arose. When I realized this, is, this truth is now continually understood, I began to understand a Dhamma unheard before. Vision arose, understanding arose, discernment arose, awareness arose, and clarity arose. When I realized this is the cause of trouble, I began to understand the Dhamma unheard before. Then vision, understanding, discernment, awareness, and clarity all arose. When I realized this truth is to be given up, so see, it's not enough to just know it. <laughs> we have to give it up. I began to understand the Dhamma unheard before, and vision, understanding, discernment, awareness, and clarity all arose. When I realized this truth has been given up, I began to understand the Dhamma unheard before, when I realized this is the release from trouble, I began to understand a dhamma unheard before. When I realized this truth is to be experienced, so this release needs to be experienced. Now the cause needs to be let go and that needs to be experienced. I began to understand a dhamma unheard before. When I realized this truth is now experienced, I began to understand the Dhamma unheard before. 
when I realized that this is the practice leading to the release of trouble, I began to understand the Dhamma unheard before. When I realized this truth should be developed, bhavana, I began to understand a Dhamma unheard before. When I realized this truth has been developed, I began to understand the Dhamma unheard before. Vision, understanding, discernment, awareness, and clarity all arose. And so long as my knowledge and direct experience of these four awakened understandings, the Four Noble Truths, as they truly are, each turning threefold in these twelve modes, had not become clear, I did not declare having fully awakened with perfect, unrivaled knowledge and understanding. In this world of its Devas and Brahmas and Maras, this generation of Samanas and Brahmanas, this with its kings and people. But when my knowledge and direct experience of these four awakened understandings, as they truly are, each turning threefold in these twelve modes, finally became very clear and perfected, I declared having fully awakened. Then direct knowledge and experience came Unshakable is my liberation. This is the final birth. There is no more rebirth from now on. This is what the awakened one said. Glad at heart, the group of five monks rejoiced in his words. And while this speech was being given, the flawless, stainless vision of the Dhamma arose in the venerable Kandanya. He directly saw and understood Whatever is of a nature to become, all of that also is of a nature to seize. Once the wheel of Dhamma was set turning by the Buddha, the earth devas exclaimed, At Varanasi in the deer park at Izipatana, the awakened one has set rolling the wheel of Dhamma, which cannot be turned back by any Samana or Brahmana, any Deva or Mara or Brahma or anyone in this world. The earth Devas having heard the celestial claim, the Devas of the four great kings ex exclaimed the same thing. Then the Brahma body of Devas exclaimed, At Varanasi in the deer park at Izipatana, the awakened one is set rolling the wheel of Dhamma, which cannot be turned back by any Samana or Brahmana, any Deva or Mara or Brahma, or any or anyone in this world. And that in that moment, in that instant, without delay, the news resounded all the way to the Brahmic plains. And then this 10,000 world system shook, trembled, and quaked, and a measureless, illustrious radiance manifested in the world, surpassing even the radiance of the brightest devas. And the awakened one spoke these inspired verses, Kandanya sees, Kandanya sees. And from then, the venerable Kandanya <laughs> came to be known as Kandanya, the one who sees. And so this is how we end our retreat. And now this wheel has been turning for 2,600 years almost. And now it is your turn to turn the wheel. And how do we do that? Is it by talking about it? <laughs> Mante would say, don't be a born again. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but the way that we turn the wheel is here. And that will spread naturally. You don't have to do anything about it. You don't have to say anything about it. If really you're practicing well, your practice is going to say everything that other people need to see. 
and people will just come to you. Don't worry, that's what happens. It's just what happens. When you practice properly, people come. When they see you happy and like really happy and unshakable happy and peaceful, they just want a piece of it. That's just what happens, you know, like it's, it's that simple. So you don't have to say anything. You don't have to teach people. That's actually coming from the wrong place. It's like trying to change others, trying to make it be the way that you want to be. That's not how you turn the wheel. You turn the wheel here and you turn the wheel here. <laughs> and then even when all of the, the wheel disappears, you're still turning the wheel <laughs> even more. So on this, um, and remember, this is your generosity, right? So the Buddha says, I was thinking about ending. The, I mean, I have to make choices in life. That's the thing. And so there's only so, so many suttas I can tell you on the last day. <laughs> but remember that uh, even feeding a uh, hundred sotapanas, feeding a hundred anagamis, even a hundred arahants, a hundred buddhas, uh, and the Buddha with the whole sangha, at its, uh, with the Buddha as, as its head, more meritorious than all of that is to take refuge with a genuine heart in the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. And then more meritorious than that is actually to take the five virtues genuinely to really want to do that. And then even more meritorious than that is, hmm, it's just my knowledge. I feel like I'm going to forget something. But even meritorious than all of that, and I just think it's just amazing that like, even if you were to feed a Buddha, just that you really take refuge for real in the Buddha Dhamma Sangha is way more meritorious and then the virtues and practicing loving kindness metta bhavana for the time of a finger snap is more meritorious than all of that so <laughs> actually I think it's it might be like the time of pulling a cow's udder but uh, yeah Vegans don't like that one, so... <laughs> yeah, so sorry all the vegans out there. <laughs> so, um, and then he says, yes, there's one thing that's actually more meritorious than that is actually developing uh, anicca sanya, basically the perception of impermanence for, for the time of the finger snap that time. So the metta is for the time of pulling a cow's udder, and then the finger snap is anicca sanya. Which, you know, in the still mind, that's pretty much what you're developing all the time. Uh, still mind or bare awareness you are, uh, and less consciousness. You're seeing like this flow of consciousness arising, arising, arising. You're training your mind to start like really detaching and seeing this impermanence all the time. So this is like pretty out there as in terms of merits. Now you've been doing that for 10 days just saying <laughs> and um, so of course the Buddha said like this is the highest generosity you can give like there's no there's there's really like there's nothing that equals that although when we understand how these things work this whole structure is based upon generosity also so of course for, for us to be here, for other people in the future to experience this, we also need a lower kind of generosity, which is, you know, uh, whatever support you can give, whether it's your time, whether it's your uh, help, whether, uh, for me in my own community, uh, but I feel like I might, uh, I might uh, stay around in India, it seems, uh, for some time. But um, bless you. <laughs> um, in my own community, I'm a pretty adamant about free Dhamma, so all of my works, books, translations are always all available for free. I really strive hard to, uh, when we have retreats in Canada, I've been really stubborn about saying 
it's got to be free. I'm sorry, but it's got to be free. And um, uh, I've had experiences, you know, that um, like Goenka says, like at the beginning, they were charging money, uh, but they soon realized that it wasn't the right way. It needed to be free. And I'm not saying like, it's, it's amazing just that this whole structure is in place, but I think from talking to uh, some of the organizers and I think everybody's kind of uh, wanting to lean more and more towards free Dhamma. And I'm really happy about that, I have to say. And uh, I want to support that as much as I can. I think the Dhamma should always be free. But for the Dhamma to be free, and I know it from my own work, um, it takes a lot of dedication and it takes support. So it takes generosity uh, also. I mean, I would love to, that was one of the things I wanted to do here was to print a whole bunch of my books and to give them all to you. But, uh, well, first I'm, I'm new here, so I don't know like where the printing presses are and like how it works. And I'm being told Mumbai is probably the best option. And uh, so it's a bit far. So I didn't get enough time. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, um, but uh, it keeps really the atmosphere of Dhamma really clear and really pure when uh, it's actually offered to you. And people will really be respectful when they receive it. It's really like a huge gift, you know, you're given a retreat and people are cooking for you and, you know, like it really, there's something that happens that makes it like participant very humble and I'm not saying that nobody here is humble. I think every, this was a really good group, in fact, just to be clear. Um, but, you know, as this thing catches on and starts to grow, then, you know, it will attract all kinds of people too. So this is really important to set down a really good foundation. And I'm a really big advocate of free Dhamma. I mean, it's in the Ratana Sutta, basically like those who have tasted the highest for free. It came for free. Like the Buddha never charged for his teachings, you know, like uh, they gave him a place to stay and people just visited him and the Dhamma has always been free. And so, I think we're really close. Actually, we don't need that much more to, we have very generous people that have allowed this to happen. Uh, I know there were some fees involved, but I think it was quite minimal. And that's really, still, that's really beautiful to see. And that's very, ins people really are inspired to see these things. When we charge, yeah, we can charge, but uh, it's not the same. Uh, people take it as a transaction. They take it as like a, a commodity. The Dhamma becomes a commodity. Like I, I paid for that retreat. I deserve like good food. I deserve all of it. <laughs> but the reality is um, actually Dhamma and it's the same thing for the monks. The monks uh, who don't handle money. We are, we're actually telling the world that what we know is worth more than money. And what we've got here actually is worth so much more than money, what we've been doing here for the past 10 days. And so obviously all of this, and that's what makes it so beautiful to know also that this was all brought to you by generosity. And this is so amazing. Um, so again, my books, you won't find them on Amazon and things like that. It's going to have to be, I'm very adamant about that. <laughs> it cannot be for sale. So uh, I'm going to try to find a way to print a few and then maybe we can have some here or have, find a way to, that it gets to you somehow. But uh, yeah, and we have some, you know, some people have donated in the past so that it, these things are possible. Um, also, and when I talk about material generosity, I don't just talk about money, by the way. Like, there's been these ladies cooking for all of us. Uh, thank you. <laughs> and then there's been Rameshji providing for all of this. I mean, this is just so beautiful and uplifting. Uh, and then there's so many people, the organizers that have been working so hard, you know, 
I don't know everybody yet because I'm just getting familiar with like, uh, and also Madhu Sudan, I'm just like, basically he's just like taking care of everything for me. And uh, so uh, just sharing merits and sharing merits is for also gladness and joy and for our own practice, it's not different at all. Um, another thing I do every retreat is I also ask for everybody's forgiveness. If I have said or done anything by body, speech, or mind that has been hurtful to you in any kind of way, I am sorry and please forgive me. It was not meant. Uh, sometimes these things, we don't know, but they happen. It's not intention, but they still happen. So please forgive me. And. Um, I only have just so much love for everybody here, so <laughs> so it's been great to spend the, that time with everyone here. Uh, I'm just looking at my little post-it here, just so I don't forget. <laughs> Highest generosity. Uh, yeah. my Your chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> Your merits, I ate it. <laughs> um, I think, uh, you know, not, uh, forgiveness is such a, an amazing thing. Uh, the monks, they just, we're not, you know, don't, don't, the Buddha would say, like, don't cover up things, don't hide anything, you know, there's nothing to hide. And when you're fully open, then you're, you're an open, clean slate, you know, you have nothing on you. Be light, travel light. And um, sounds like it's about it for me tonight. <laughs> um, I mean, there's, I guess there's a few things, but uh, yeah, that's it. There was a request, because I'm trying to also cover a few things that were talked about, and I'm trying to remember, but right now my, my brain is just clogged. <laughs> it's just, uh, it's cleared, but it's, I can't really think very well right now. <laughs> Just like a... <laughs> there was a request for some group metta to end the retreat. So I don't know if you're interested in that. I, are we postponing the question to another retreat? I think we might. Are we 6 ring the questions? 6, <laughs> six ring the post-its? Maybe you can come to me tomorrow if you've got some more time. I don't know. I'll be here for a few days. I'll just rest and meditate and uh, prepare for the Kalimpong retreat. So I'll be around in India for a little bit more, I guess. Uh, this uh, <laughs> It seems like uh, I'm getting sucked in, um, which is nice. I said to Madhusudan, well, sure, I don't mind being stuck in India for a while. <laughs> Um, so yeah, it seems like in, in the 10 days I'll be flying to Kalimpong. So, okay, let's end with this beautiful metta. And uh, I guess I've been talking and not really. <laughs> Oops. Would you like to say, uh, translate? So please just let go of everything that you're thinking right now and sit back, relax, take a comfortable position, whatever the position doesn't matter. You can start by calming down your whole body, let go of everything that was said during the talk, let go of everything that you might be thinking for tomorrow. And let your awareness simply naturally drop down into your heart. And feel this radiant, beautiful, loving kindness, like a shining sun, a radiant disk of light. naturally suffusing everything that it encounters 
everything it touches. And remember to enjoy this smile. Indulge in that pleasure of sharing love for all living beings. No need to push, no need to force. Just see the light of your love. Shining in the whole universe. Just feel it. And this time, stay with the metta, just the metta.
Do you have anybody in your family, in your friends, anybody that you know you would like to share the fruits, the merits <coughs> that were acquired here, that were developed, the happiness, the freedom of mind. You can send them some metta too. And share your merits, share your <coughs> metta. May they also get benefit. May they come upon Dhamma. May they also experience such happiness and freedom. benefit from your practice, from our practice. May our practice be for the betterment of every living being. get to experience what we've been experiencing on this retreat. May they all come upon goodness, kindness, love, compassion, joy, May all living beings be at peace and be secure. May all beings be happy.
May this place be protected. Sabka Mangalaho. Suffering ones be suffering free, and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share these merits that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty powers, Share these merits of ours. May they long protect the Buddha Sasana. Sad, sad, sad. Thank you. I wish you the best journey. <laughs> Yes, uh, I meant to write my email address on that board, <laughs> um, and um, where I I am and we are uh, on Signal, an app, a messaging app. Um, so you can find me there. Also, we have a group. Uh, you can. You're welcome to be part of it. The Heart Dhamma community. I will be writing my email on the whiteboard. Feel free to give me an email, uh, whatever arises. Um, otherwise, heartdhamma.love. This is where all the information is. All my sutta translation, all my work, all my books. Uh, retreat schedules, uh, dana, uh, what, uh, heart dhamma, heart wood, heart wood, hermitage, all of it is is there. So, um, is that enough? <laughs> okay, good. Mm. Okay, acha. Tomorrow, oh yes. <laughs> Tomorrow, um, same thing. Uh, precepts in the morning, same time, I think. Unless I'm, I'm not aware of. Is it same time or is it later? Yes. Okay. Okay. You guys tell me. <laughs> so, five thirty. Okay, five thirty. We take the five precepts tomorrow. That'd be eight. Um, yeah, that's about it. If you'd like to take them in Pali, you can maybe come to me or like do the traditional way, but it's really if you want. Uh, okay. Is that it? Okay, okay, good. <laughs> Tang Tang Namasami Harissa Vanna Patavim Pabhasam Dayanja Gudunda Vihare Muratim Himbra Mena Veda Gusab Chamam